title of this message is called Shut In with Jesus. You know, brethren, everything that we do has to lead somewhere. There's always an end result to everything. So let's ask ourselves, what is the end result of salvation? What is the end result of us going through trials and tribulations and going through the pain of living in this world and even the joy of service for Christ, where does it lead to? It leads to a place. And I want to take you to that place by using the prophetical word found in the book of Daniel. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Daniel. I want you to look at it from your Bible as well and from the screen that we may receive that blessing God desires us to receive. <clears throat> Before we go to Daniel, let's read this wonderful quote from Early Writings, page 63, paragraph 2. There are many precious truths contained in the Word of God, but it is what? Present truth that the flock needs now. I have seen the danger of messengers running off from the important points of present truth to dwell upon the subjects that are not calculated to unite the flock and sanctify the soul. Do you see what I'm saying? There are subjects that we can talk about even here right now that will not be calculated to unite the flock and to sanctify the soul. And what we should dwell on is present truth. Okay? Satan will here take every possible advantage to injure the cause when the right message is not being presented. Okay? But such subjects as the sanctuary, in connection with the 2300 days, the commandments of God, the faith of Jesus, are perfectly calculated to explain past Advent movement and show our present position, establish the faith of the doubting, right? Give certainty to the glorious future. These I have frequently seen were the principal subjects on which the messengers should dwell. That's beautiful right there. She said present truth is what we should dwell on. She tells us what present truth is. The 2300 days in connection with the commandments, in connection with the sanctuary, the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus are perfectly calculated to explain the past. And you know that little thing that says, if, if we forget our past, what is it? We're doomed to repeat it, right? As a matter of fact, Sister White says in page 196 of Life Sketches, she says, we have nothing to fear for the future lest we forget the way God has led us in the past. Okay? So it explains our past Advent movement, which is very important, because when you read early writings, what happens to those who disregarded the, the, the midnight cry light? They fell off that narrow path. And show what our present position is. Don't we want to know what our work is today? What we should exactly be doing? Well, present truth shows us that. Right? Establish the faith of the doubting. Have you met doubting Seventh-day Adventists who doubt the spirit of prophecy, who doubt some of our, 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 our foundational beliefs about prophecy? Have you come across that? Well, present truth will take care of that problem. Establish the faith of the doubting. Give certainty to the glorious future. You can be confident that there is salvation in Christ Jesus through present truth. She says, these are frequently seen are the principal subjects on which the messengers should dwell. So that's what we're going to dwell on. That's what we're going to dwell on. And you notice that the, the present truth is calculated to unite the flock. The reason why we have so much differences among us, even as a people, is because present truth is not being presented. 
Daniel 8, verse 8. Follow along with me. This, this is, this is going to be very critical. Daniel 8, verse 8. Therefore the he-goat, who's the he-goat? Who's the he-goat? Greece, the kingdom of Greece, Alexander the Great, waxed very great. And when he was strong, the great horn was broken. And you remember he died, right? And four of it came up, four notable horns towards the four winds of heaven, right? Continuing on, and out of one of them came forth the little horn. Who's the little horn? The papacy, which waxed exceedingly great towards the south and towards the east, towards the pleasant land. And it says, and it waxed great, that is the papacy, even to the host of heaven. Who's the host of heaven? Christ, the heavenly trio. He waxed great to them. The God of gods. And it cast down, that means to do away, some of the host. That's God's people. You see, this one is the heavenly host, but this is just the host. If you look at that in the, in the concordance, it means a multitude of people. So it cast down or do away or persecuted God's people. That's the papacy. And some of the stars, God's messengers. Remember in, 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 in um, Revelation, to the angel of the so-and-so church, I write those things. And he says that the seven stars that I hold in my hand are what? The seven angels of the seven churches, meaning the messengers, to the ground and stamped, oppressed, stamped up on them. He trampled up on them. Isn't that true? Isn't that what the papacy did? It persecuted the saints of the Most High. It killed the, those who are messengers for God. It, they burnt some of them alive. Is that the truth? Is that what happened? Absolutely. In Daniel verse 8, 11, Yea, the little horn, the papacy, magnified himself even to the prince of the host. That's Christ Jesus. By him, by the little horn or the papacy, the daily sacrifice was taken away. So the papacy took away the daily. What's the daily? Has anybody studied that subject? No one? Anyone? So at least we have a clue. The little horn would take away the daily. But here's another clue. That word, the daily, if you look at it, means continuity or continually. So that's why it's, it's translated here as daily. Now the word sacrifice is italicized if you look in your Bible. And actually, the prophet of the Lord said, it doesn't belong there. Okay? She says the daily continuity, uh, it says that the daily or the continuity was taken away by the papacy. And, and in order for, for us to find out what the daily is, we know that the papacy took it away. We know it means continuity, but in order to understand what that word means, we need to look at where it's been used. That's what a good Bible student would do, like William Miller. That's what he did. He said, let me find out where this word is used. And that word is used mainly in the book of Numbers, in Exodus, mainly in the book of Numbers, but you find it in Exodus and other places also. But here's what, what, where that word would be used. It would say something like, Aaron would go and burn incense. Guess how, how, guess how many? Continually or daily. That word would be translated as continuity or continually in some places. It just meant that the high priest would go into the sanctuary and would perform the daily duties. What are some of the daily duties in the sanctuary? You burn incense. You make sure that there's oil in the lamp, right? Where well, the bread was changed only once a week. Okay? So that's what, that's what he would do. That's what the high priest would do. Right? Or, and all the other priests as well. They would come and do that. But when the tabernacle was being established, it particularly said, Aaron shall go daily 
and do this or do that. That's where that word daily is used. Okay? So in order for us to understand the use, then it means that we need to understand where it's been used. Now that we understand where it's been used, now we can say, let's read this verse again. Yea, the little horn, the papacy, magnified himself even to the prince of the host. What is Jesus doing in, in, in heaven right now? Interceding on our behalf, and, and he's our what? Our heavenly high? That's right. So when he ascended to heaven, he went into the holy place, and he began to officiate for us before the Father. And that's what happened here. And it tells us that. But it says, that when, this is now, he even cast the prince of the host, right? And by him, the little horn of the papacy, the daily sacrifice was taken away. Now, in order for us to understand what taken away means, we need to understand the furnitures in the sanctuary in order to be able to understand what's going on in the sanctuary, whether in heaven or on earth. So go with me into the sanctuary. Right in front of you, what do you see when you come in? Come on, Adventist. That's you, your Bible students. I expect you to know, right? As soon as you come in, you will see the altar of incense right in front of you. To your right, what is there? The table of showbread. On your left, what do you have? The lamp the, or the candlesticks, right? So what does the lamp represent? Yes, that's right. The seven candlesticks out of seven, that's right. Now, what are the churches supposed to do? Be a light to the world. So that represents the church of God witnessing. Okay? What about the altar of incense? What does that represent? The altar of incense? That's right. It means the prayers of the saints. It represents prayer life. And on your right, you have the table of showbread, and what does that represent? That, that represents the Bible. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So we have witnessing, we have prayer, and we have Bible study. All the scriptures. Now, with that being said, did the papacy do away with witnessing in the Dark Ages? Yes. Did they do away with praying to God that you have to go through a priest to do that? Did that happen? Absolutely. Did they take away the Bibles? Absolutely. So what they did was they magnified themselves even to the prince of the host and by him, by the little horn, the daily, that continuity, things that we should be doing on a daily basis, witnessing and so on. He took that down. And in place of that, he put his, his in, in, in place of that, this, I'm sorry, the, he took away the daily, sacrifice was taken away, and in place of his, Christ's sanctuary, was cast down. That means they tried to obscure Christ's ministry in the heavenly sanctuary, meaning you didn't look to heaven to see your heavenly high priest and to repent of your sins. Now you look to earthly priests. Do you get what I'm saying? So what the papacy did by taking away the daily is to obscure Christ's ministration in the holy place, in the heavenly sanctuary. That's what the daily means, brother and sister. It's not a complicated subject. I know there's division even in, among us about this, and I'm not trying to do that. I'm leading to a point. Okay? Bear with me. And a an host, an army, was given him to the papacy against the daily. Is that what happened? In order for him to obscure all these things, was an army given to the papacy? Yes, the papacy used the monarchs of Europe to, to persecute God's people, not to see the heavenly sanctuary, but the earthly. Is that right? Absolutely. An army was given to him against the daily, the continuity, right? The sacrifice by reason of transgression. What does it mean by reason of transgression, brothers and sisters? By sin. And you know what that sin is? You look at Revelation chapter 17, verse 2. It talks about Babylon having unlawful connection with the kings of the earth. 
That's the transgression. Is that what happened with the papacy? Absolutely, brethren and sisters. So with this unlawful connection led to, the, to, to them having an army and taking away the daily. And it cast down the truth. It cast down the truth to the ground. And it practiced and prospered. Now, very interesting thing here. I believe it's in on the one. It says here, it, it cast down, it, it, it said, it, t- it take away in the place of his sanctuary. It says here that the sacrifice was taken away and the place of his sanctuary was cast down, meaning it tried to cast down, obscure Christ's ministry in the heavenly sanctuary, right? Now, it tells us this. It says, it cast down some of the truth to the ground. So, in the previous verse, it's telling us the sanctuary was cast down, and in this one, it's telling us the truth is cast down. But I'll submit to you, if you really understand the Jewish mind, you will see that sometimes they use different words to describe the same thing. What do I mean by that? Look at Revelation 17. It says that the woman sitteth upon many waters. And then it says the woman is sitting upon a beast, a scarlet colored beast. Okay? And then it says it sits upon this. Sitting upon waters and sitting upon that beast is the same thing. But the Bible writers, the Jewish mind works in, 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 the, in that type of way, in the, in the description that it, it, it gives. So with that in mind, I'll submit to you the truth that was cast to the ground and the sanctuary that was cast to the ground is one and the same thing. Well, where's the biblical proof? Psalm 77, 13, thy way, O God, is in the what? The truth of God is in the sanctuary. The truth of salvation is in the sanctuary. And that is so because Paul told us, verily the gospel was preached unto them as well as us. And he said it was preached to them through, how, how is it preached to them? In the Old Testament. Through types, right? And shadows. Right? That's how this, it was preached to them. So it cast down the truth to the ground, the truth of God's word that was in the sanctuary, brethren and sisters. And it practiced and prospered. Verse 13. Then I heard one saint, that's Gabriel, speaking to another saint and said unto a certain saint, that's Jesus Christ, Michael, which spake, how long shall be the vision concerning the daily? So what's the question being asked by, by, by Gabriel here? How long will the papacy continue to obscure Christ's ministry in the holy place? Notice I'm, 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 I'm straining the fact that this, we're talking about the holy place, not the most holy. Hang on, okay? So he asked that question, how long? Is the papacy going to continue to do that? Notice what it says. Uh, and transgression of desolation, right? This transgression led to desolation. To give both the sanctuary, okay, the truth, and the host, God's people, to be trodden underfoot. Two questions being asked here, right? How long will it be until the truth be vindicated and God's people are going to come out of persecution? Are you with, is everyone with me? Clear so far? I don't want to lose anyone. This is so beautiful, the end result that we're going to come to. So you see, now this, this question that's being asked receives an answer. Notice, Daniel 8, 14. This is the very axis of seven-day Adventism. And he said unto me, the answer, how long will the heavenly sanctuary, the truth, be obscured? And how long until persecution end? It says, and he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then the what? The sanctuary be? Now, remember I told you two, two questions are being asked, right? How many questions were answered by this verse? Come on, Bible students. Only one. Only about the sanctuary. Let's go back and look at it. It said, to give both the sanctuary and the host, 
to be trodden underfoot. And in Daniel 8, 14, Gabriel, uh, 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 Jesus gives us the answer to the sanctuary aspect, but we haven't yet received the, the aspect about the host. But he says, on to 2,300 days, then the sanctuary will be vindicated. The truth of God's word will once again come into prominence. That's what that says. Can I give you a big guess as to who he picked to vindicate him? The Seventh Day Adventist Movement. I'm so glad the pastor said we're not just a denomination but a movement. You know that book, what is it called? The, the, the Church of Destiny? Uh, we are destined, brothers and sisters. The movement that we belong to is so sacred, so highly viewed by heaven. I think, I think we need to pray to God to help us to realize more of what it means to us. So he said, and he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then the truth, the sanctuary that's been obscured will be cleansed, or the word means justified. In the concordance, that word cleanse means justified. I will justify my truth unto 2,300 days. Notice what Sister White says in the Great Controversy, page 423, paragraph 1. The subject of the sanctuary was the what? The key which unlocked the mystery of the disappointment of 1844. Understanding the sanctuary prevented them from being so severely disappointed and seeing Jesus again. That means they literally, when they were discouraged, they had to go to the Word of God, and the Word of God told them about the sanctuary, and they were like, oh, it solved the mystery for us. Do you see how the Bible can solve your problems and my problems? That's what the pioneers did. They were good students. It opened to view the complete system of truth, connected and harmonious, showing that God's hand had directed the great Advent movement. They said this wasn't for nothing. This disappointment was not for nothing. But God had a hand in it. How did they know that? By studying the subject of the sanctuary. <clears throat> and the re revealing present duty as it brought to light the position and the work of his people. Not only did it explain and make them feel okay about their disappointment, but it said, oh, this is what we're supposed to be doing now. That's what the sanctuary did for the pioneers. Oh, it was marvelous, brethren. Just imagine that we're going and experiencing this ourselves as we go through this presentation. Those who by faith followed their great high priest as he entered upon his ministry in the most holy place, Beheld the ark of his testament. That's how they found out their present duty. And continue on. As they had studied the subject of the sanctuary, they had come to understand the Savior's change of ministration, and they saw that he was now officiating before the ark of God, pleading his blood in behalf of sinners. So, as they followed the high priest into the most holy place, they said, oh, this is what we're supposed to be doing now. We realize what it means to be in this movement. So, I want us to experience that same experience that they had. Let's look into our Bibles and see what they saw to come to the realization why they had to obey the commandments of God. All of them. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. Oh, brethren and sisters, this is marvelous stuff here. This is marvelous, marvelous stuff. Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. We're going to read it. Verses 1 through 4b. Okay. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances and divine service, and a worldly sanctuary, 
For there was a tabernacle made the first, wherein was the candlestick, the tabernacle of show, I'm sorry, the table of showbread, which is called the sanctuary. After the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. Now we're entering into the most holiest, which had the golden censer, the ark of the covenant overlaid about with gold. Do you remember what we said about the incense? What does the incense represent? Do we see the incense in the most holy place? Is prayer still essential? Absolutely. Absolutely. And then they beheld the ark. They beheld the ark. And when they beheld the ark, do you know what was in the ark? Wherein was the golden pot of what? Manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant. So, as they entered and looked at the furniture, they realized, okay, there's the Ark of the Covenant. And what's in the Ark of the Covenant? There's the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and there's the Ten Commandments. So they said to themselves, the Spirit of God impressed their hearts of those students of His Word. The conviction was urged upon them. They had ignorantly transgressed His precept by disregarding the Creator's rest day. They could not find no evidence in the Scriptures that the fourth commandment had been abolished. They had been honestly seeking to know and to do God's will. Now they saw themselves as transgressors of His law. Sorrow filled their hearts and they manifested their loyalty to God by keeping his Sabbath holy. That's how our pioneers found out about the Sabbath. They said, oh, the, the Ten Commandments, they're in there? Okay, let's go through the commandments. Let's see. And when they went through the commandments, they were like, oh, it seems like we're keeping nine, but that one is elusive to us. So when they saw themselves as transgressors, they repented and started keeping God's commandments. Isn't that marvelous? Now, <clears throat> what did the Aaron's rod represent? I'm sorry? Not quite. Not quite. Let's look at the history of Aaron's rod. How did Aaron's rod come about that budded? And why was it placed in the ark as a witness? What was the issue? Certain men came and said, we can be high priests also. It's not Aaron only that could be high priest, right? So Moses said, okay, bring your rods and let's see who, who's, whose rod God accepts. And who's, who's, whose rod budded? And Aaron was picked. And Aaron was a, a type of what? A type of Christ. So you see, the rod that budded was an indication as a witness to say, Christ's ministry as the heavenly priest in the sanctuary. That's what it represented. Do you know there are many other religions that believe Jesus Christ is a good prophet? And he is a prophet, but he's more than a prophet according to the heavenly sanctuary, the most holy place. He's the high priest. But do you know the only denomination, the only religion on the face of this earth that recognizes Jesus Christ as a heavenly high priest? Can you guess? The Seventh-day Adventist church. Only one. Can you imagine why they came about to, how they came about to that conclusion? By studying the sanctuary, present truth. And so when they went and saw this, and when they saw the history of what Aaron's rod meant, they realized and understood Christ's ministry. They said, ah, he's our high priest in the most holy place. Now, what about the manna? 
<clears throat> what did the manna represent? I think my brother had the correct thing. The health message. And how do we know that? Well, let me take you back to the history of why that manna was put into the ark as a witness. The people of Israel were leaving Egypt, and two weeks afterwards, they ran out of food. And when they ran out of food, God said, well, I'm going to give you what I desire for you to eat. And after a little bit after eating that, what did they say? We don't want this stuff anymore. The Bible said man did eat angel's food. And I believe the Bible that angels eat manna in heaven. But man, in his wicked appetite, he said, I don't want it. I want the flesh pots of Egypt. They didn't just come up with this stuff arbitrarily, you know. There was a systematic way of studying the Bible that led them to this conclusion. And as a witness, God said, Moses, put some of that manna into the ark as a witness against them that I fed them with good food that would make them healthy, but they refused me. Do you think that's happening today? Do you think God is saying, this is the choice of food that I have for you? And we say, mm -mm, I want the flesh pots of Egypt. Do you think that's happening today? Mercy on us, Lord. Mercy on us. Early writings, page 54 to page 56. I, if, if anything, I want you to pay attention on this one. It's very critical. Matter of fact, it's so critical, I want to say another word of prayer. Father in heaven, as we read this, these words in early writing, please give us your spirit, Father. Help us to be attentive in Jesus' name. Amen. Follow along with me. I saw the throne. This is talking about the change of administration from the, from the holy place to the most holy. This is Sister White's vision. I saw the throne, and on it sat the Father and the Son. I gazed on Jesus' countenance and admired his lovely person. The Father's person I could not behold, for a cloud of glorious light covered him. I asked Jesus if, if his Father had the form like unto himself. He said he had, but I could not behold it. For, he, for said he, if thou should once behold the glory of his person, you, should, you, would, you would cease to exist. Now some people may have a problem with that. They were like, oh, Ella, Ella White's... So, and, and she saw the form of the person, and Jesus told her that he, 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 the Father looks just like him. Well, look at Genesis 1.1. Look at Genesis, and you can just see clearly, let us make man in what? Our image. It's not a trick question. Do you see what I'm saying? Let us not quibble about these trivial things. And it goes on to say, before the, the throne I saw the Advent people. Before the what? She said, before the throne, I saw the Advent people. That's William Miller and all the folks there. <clears throat> the church and the world. So who was there by the throne? The Advent people, the church, and the world. Okay? I saw two companies. One bowed down before the throne, deeply interested, while the other stood uninterested and careless. Those who were bowed before the throne would offer up their prayers and look to Jesus. Then he would look to his father and, and appear to, to be pleading. So when they prayed, the bowing company that was very interested, they would pray and Jesus, Jesus would, 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 would take that and he, he, he would be pleading with his father when they would say, give us your spirit. Continuing on. A light would come from the father to the son and from the sun to the praying company. Then I saw an exceeding bright light come from the Father to the sun, and from the sun it waved over the people before the throne. But few could receive this great light. Many came out from under it and immediately resisted it. Others were careless and did not cherish the light, and it moved off from them. Some cherished it and went and bowed down with the with the little praying company. 
This company all received the light and rejoiced in it. Their countenance was shunned with its glory. Now, that's, that's the company that was deeply interested. It seems like the company that were in Christ. I saw the Father rise from the throne and in flaming chariot go into the holy, holy of holies, right? Within the veil and sit down. Then Jesus rose up from the throne and most of those who were bowed down arose with him. That praying, interested company. When Jesus moved, they said, uh-oh, he's moving, let's move with him. I did not see one ray of light pass from Jesus to the careless multitudes after he rose. That, those are the ones who were still bowed down, that were careless. Okay? And they were left in perfect darkness. Those who arose when Jesus did kept their eyes fixed on him as he left the throne and led them out a little way. Then he said to them, then he raised his right arm and he waved his lovely, and, he heard, and we heard his lovely voice saying, Wait here, I'm going to my father to receive the kingdom. Keep your garments spotless, and in a little while I will return from the wedding and receive you unto myself. So he tells this, this company that, that were in Christ, he says, Listen, wait for me here. I'm going to go into the most holy place. But I'll come and receive you unto myself. Don't worry. Then... A cloudy chariot with wheels like flaming fire surrounded by angels came to where Jesus was. He stepped onto the chariot and was born into the holiest where the Father sat. Then I beheld Jesus, a great high priest, standing before the Father. On the, on the, on the hem of his garments was a bell and a pomegranate, a bell and a pomegranate. Those who rose up with Jesus would send up their faith to him in the holiest and pray my father give us thy spirit then jesus will breathe upon them the holy ghost in that breath was light power and much love joy and peace okay so even when jesus went into the most holiest this company still prayed and when they prayed father give us your spirit jesus would breathe upon them and give them his spirit i turned to look at the company who were still bowed before the throne this is the careless ones. They did not know that Jesus had left it. Satan appeared to be by the throne, trying to carry on the work of God. I saw them look up to the throne and pray. This is the careless multitude praying now. Father, give us thy spirit. Satan would breathe upon them the unholy influence. In it, there was light and much power. But no sweet love, joy, and peace. Satan's object was to keep them deceived and to draw back and deceive God's children. This is so solemn, brothers and sisters. You see, the, 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 the praying company, the, the ones that were in Christ, they, they rose, as soon as Jesus moved, they knew he was moving. They were like, he's moving. Kept their eyes fixed on Jesus. But the careless multitude, they were so careless, they were still bowed down. They didn't even know Jesus had moved into the most holy place. And so when they prayed, oh, give us your spirit, this unholy influence from Satan would come and there would be much power. But there would be no sweet love and joy. And do you know, do you know the only ones that have followed Jesus into the most holy place are those who have accepted those truths that are found in the most holy place? The health message? Christ being our heavenly high priest and keeping the commandments of God. For that's the only way you could be in the most holy. Because when the, when, when the saints of God decided to keep the Sabbath, the rest of the world said, no, you don't have to. But those who were shut in with Jesus into the most holy place, they said, no, 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 no. no. If I'm going to follow Jesus in the most holy and his work is officiating before the ark, then that, that Ten Commandments have to mean something. That's how I know Christ's work. That's how I know Christ's ministry is because I, I look at the furnitures and I study them, and it tells me what Jesus' job is in the heavenly sanctuary. Does that make perfect sense to us? But you see, those who are left in the holy place, 
said, we don't need to keep the Sabbath. We don't need to keep the health message. And we surely are not going to recognize the sanctuary message that you all are talking about. And so they were left, as she said, in perfect darkness. But you notice that they, they, it seems like they had much power, didn't they? Does it seem like there's much power when people are being knocked down in churches? Apparent healings? Does it look like there's much power? That's right. But no sweet joy, peace, none of that is present. But those who follow Jesus into the most holy receive the benefits of what he has to offer. So we, as we read to you in Hebrews chapter uh, 5, and we said, we said in chapter, I'm sorry, in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 4, which has the golden censer, the ark of the covenant overlaid around about with gold, wherein was the golden pot of manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant. And over it the cherubims of glory, shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. Did you get that? Excuse me. Did you get what Paul said right there? He said, he's telling us about the most holy place, but during his time he said, I can't speak about this particularly. Why couldn't he speak about it particularly? In detail. Why couldn't he speak about it? Someone has the right idea back there. Let me take you to Daniel 8, chapter, 4, uh, chapter 8, verse 14. On to 2,300 days, then the sanctuary will be cleansed. That truth, the truth that we hold, would not come about until 1844. And so Paul said, this sanctuary message will not be revealed particularly until the time comes. So it, it, it's powerful, brethren and sisters. Now notice what it says. It is labor lost to teach the people to look to God as the healer of their infirmities unless they are taught also to lay aside unhealthful practices. In order to receive his blessing and answer the prayer, they must cease to do evil and learn to do well. Their surroundings must be sanitary, their habits of life correct, they must live in harmony with the laws of God, both natural and spiritual. So you see, brethren, most of us who do not keep the health message, we're not in the most holy place. If we don't recognize Jesus as a high priest, we're not in the most holy place. If we don't recognize the commandments of God, we're not in the most holy place. The Bible tells us that if you break one commandment, it's like you've broken them all. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, go with me there. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. I think this will become very clear in the light of the sanctuary. Notice what the Bible says, verse 16. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? Isn't that text used a lot of times when we do health presentations? Notice what it says, the next sentence. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. So what does it say? If any man defile the temple of God. But now if we wanted to get a good definition, I'm trying to understand, like, what, what does defile mean? And I'm not looking in a dictionary or anything, but I'm starting to say, what does defile mean? Let me find out what the Bible considers defilement of the body. Go with me to Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8. Right back in Daniel. Daniel 
chapter 8. I'm sorry, Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. Excuse me. Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. This is a very familiar story to you. Notice what it says in verse 8. But Daniel purposed it in his what? He made a decision for Christ and heaven moved. That he would not, def what's that word? Defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the one which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuch that he might not what? Defile what? himself. You want to know a definition? That's it. And because of that faithfulness, and because of that faithfulness, we're told about verse 17. Notice in verse 17 in that same chapter, and as for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill in all what? Learning and and Daniel had understanding in all what? In dreams. He understood prophecy, and he understood the scripture, and he understood when God spoke to him. Now, we might have taken the health message, the high priestly ministration of Christ, the commandments of God lightly. But today, right now, this moment, if any one of us, if we purpose it in our hearts that we're going to obey, heaven is going to move for us like it did for Daniel. So the question that I have for us and the commitment that I am wanting us to make is this, who will be shut in with Jesus? Who will begin to say, Lord, I am going into the most holy by faith and obey you? Keep your commandments, recognize your high priestly ministry, and keep the health message. How many are willing to do that? If you are, I want you to come forward. I want you to come forward if you feel that this message has convicted your heart and you want to be shut in with Jesus in the most holy place. You remember that quote I read to you in a previous presentation? Come just as you are to Jesus, placing your helpless souls upon his care. And that will subdue the pride of heart and is a crucifixion of self. And you remember what I told you, that when you stood up and walked up, your guardian angel just went to heaven and told Jesus, commitment has been made. And Jesus right now, as we speak, is presenting before his Father, just as we read in early writings, Father, give us your spirit. What does Jesus do? He goes and pleads with the Father, and that light comes to all of us who are standing here. I don't, it doesn't matter what your circumstance. It doesn't matter what people have said about you. It doesn't matter what has been done in the past. But today, right this minute, a new beginning can start. A new beginning can start for you and for myself. I'm committing right here with you. I'm still in the battle of life. Amen? So let us kneel as we're able before our maker and plead for his Holy Spirit. Father in heaven, your people have come before you as well as myself, Father. And we have made commitments to obey you and be shut in with you in the most holy place. And we are praying and asking for your spirit. We saw it clearly, practically, how you answered the prayers of the saints in the past and how that beautiful light came shining upon them and they had peace 
joy and love in their hearts. Lord, we ask the same. We ask, Father, for that peace and joy and love that can only come from Jesus, your Son. We ask, Father, that you would give us your spirit to overcome any besetting sin and appetite that we, Father, may be victorious. Please, help our trembling souls, Father. Some of us don't even know how we're going to make it, how we're going to get rid of that thing. But, Father, we need not worry. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Help us to take hope in that beautiful promise that you are able to succor them, even to the uttermost, to those who come by you. So we ask for the blessing that you sincerely and desperately want to give us victory over sin. This we want to ask in Jesus' name. Amen.